All right, we are going live on YouTube momentarily. And uh, let me just uh, stop my video and go silent. And then Shonda, take it away. when you pushed my skin into a blue corner and fanned the Michigan moon into a white fire. My youth in your fingers like candle wax, the clock forging ahead, there wasn't much time. You worked quietly, diligently against the famous bruises you grew deaf at hiding from your sisters, unaware that they were hiding theirs from you, gifts, of hard love, no gifts from hell. But still, I grew into something. It was that flame you pushed into me, mama, smoothed it down, seated it in my navel for later, knowing that I was young and you were older, wiser, married a third time, seven children from virginhood, one father from innocence, one mother from forgiveness. I remember nights when you rubbed my back and sang swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home, swing low. Sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. You spilled Vicks over my chest, my mosquito bumps, dime thin back and hummed long into the dusk, forcing the bronchitis that almost killed me twice into a soft wheeze. And I lived, bred off plantation prayer in menthol. Later, forgetful, I never knew your stiff back held me at the kitchen sink. Your fingers soapy with dish water and tears, all the knowing of a woman in that water and you'd sniff and move away. I thought you were making it all up, making it look harder than it really was. Men, love, holding things, raising, us and I said nothing, but I was a child and it was all right. And I grew into something. These memories come and I am folding, the way, folding them away from my daughter like her, her, she needs it. And like all good mother spiders do while they wash dishes and spin white flames and watch and hum. Welcome everyone. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the road to joy. Uh, tonight we are, we are here having choir as Peter Harris would 
would call this, but uh, we are here. Thank you, Cody, for bringing Peter Harris and Imani Tolliver and myself together. Incredibly grateful. Welcome to the songs and signs of hope and healing. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do with language. This is what we do with language. So We Hope Reads 2022 is here in the house, Road to Joy. This is our literary, literary joy moment, joyful moment. And I get the pleasure of uh, introducing um, the concept of healing and what it means to me and what it has meant, particularly with that first song that I sang. And that song is a Shumash children's honoring song and I love to introduce readings with that song one because we are on the Shumash and Tonva land in Los Angeles California uh, and many other nations lands here uh, in in the LA County California uh, state area but I love to sing it because I learned it in a sweat lodge I learned that that's a song that you get to sing to honor the children but also the child in yourself and the child and yourself that maybe didn't get a song like that, or maybe didn't get that kind of healing. And so when I sing that song, I'm thinking of all my ancestors. I'm thinking of my mother who had a hard life. I'm thinking of myself who felt a bit misunderstood by my mom and singing that song and, and writing and being able to read a poem introduces that sense of how I have taught myself to use language and song to heal and how people have taught me that as well on this road and what we, uh, I'm African-American with American Indian heritage and what we call that red road of healing as well. So I am incredibly honored to be able to introduce the next poet, my brethren, mm -hmm. Peter J. Harris. And I have known Peter J. Harris, we realized for over 28 years, 29 years, maybe 30 years. And it has been, I have to say that Peter Harris is one of the people who, if he had not have been in my life, I would be writing differently. Mm. I would be writing different poems. I would have seen the world differently. I might not have said something to my daughter that she needed to hear because Peter J. Harris was on the <laughs> stage or in the house or, showing me or saying something to me that made me uh, remember or laugh or just gave me the sense of um, don't, don't BS, don't BS, don't pussyfoot, put it out there, say it, say that thing, name it and heal from it. So I get to introduce Peter J next and I'm gonna let him take it away and then he will introduce Imani and then we will continue on with this beautiful journey. Mm -hmm. mm. First thing, first thing out the mouth, don't even have to be words. Rapture scatting, praise faces beaming, good in you bending light in the room. Illuminate, do right, coursing in the bloodstream of people you meet or children you raise. <laughs> Enunciate the first thing, like you a duet partner with Sarah Vaughn. Mm. Send in the clowns for real. Laughter scatters red joy. Baggy improvisation brightens eyes. Muses merry-go-round. Like, what if the first thing sound like Muhammad Ali floating boats on a summer cloud? Sweet honey, blending out front of a militant hum. Malcolm pinpointing on a cushion of New Day Errol Garner. Mother Wit, guiding by the light of Ida B. Wells. What if the first thing sound like you, yourself, being to the core of daylight in your baby's eye? What is the sound of the second thing, third thing? If the first thing out my mouth wear on the ear with proof of an original tongue, what is the movement that follows when you have been 
touched by electric confidence and been told ever so sincerely, day to day, on a regular basis, without even one request for interpersonal refund. Baby, you are a miracle wrapped up in human flesh. Can I get a witness, Imani Tolliver? Amen. 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 Can I get a witness? Amen. I, I, I'm not going to go, sis. It's all yours. It's your mic. It's your mic. This is a shout out to Frida Kahlo. Despite the Judas body she painted, the body that cut their son into pieces and still she painted. Garden flowers in her hair, a rebozo on her shoulders, she painted. Her Diego found the flesh of women irresistible as did she, irresistible. If I were her lover, I would caution the seams, the cut and sewn parts. She would hold me in the same mouth worn by Pozole, Chile, her lick a sliver of flan with caramel at the tip. I would coax the sweet peel back the bristle to find the tender waiting, becoming the taste of what tastes it. Her paintings follow me. They come as cards, trinkets from women always. The jewelry, the paintings, the tiny altars and books tell me speak. Mm -hmm. You must speak. Cough the ribbons of your tongue free. Lick the flesh that calls you ink fingertips when you cannot find a brush. Walls when canvas is not nearby. Put flowers in your hair. Mm -hmm. The big gorgeous ones from your garden. Wear the colors of your own flag. Create when baffled. Create when sorrowful. Abandon the prickle of fear and be of your own making. Begin deep, deep. Feel the tremor, the push, the work root, the quaking blossom of who you really are. Let light, let you be free. Nice, 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 nice. <laughs> I love the cacophony. I mm. love this piece. Mm, 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 um, thank you. So uh, if we want to introduce ourselves, we can. For those of you who do not know us, I am Shonda Buchanan. I'm the author of several books, uh, including uh, who's afraid of black Indians? Oh, wait, hold on. Ah, voila. Who's afraid of black Indians? <laughs> I'm the author of this memoir, Black Indian, as well, and a couple of other books. And I teach at Loyola Marymount University. Imani, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Uh, my name is Imani Tolliver. Uh, I'm a poet, I'm an artist, and an educator. Um, I am an author also. I'm reading tonight. Plus one, one extra, but I'm reading from my memoir, uh, Runaway, mm. a memoir in verse. Um, and uh, I guess there's, there's probably way more to say. Uh, I have a website, imanitoliver.com for more details and uh, interesting interviews and all kinds of other kinds of media. That's me. <laughs> Sweet. Right, right. Mm. Hey. I'm Peter Harris. Blackmanofhappiness.com is the landing uh, for everything I'm doing these days. But I'm super honored to be here with y'all. Yeah. Me too. Thank you. Yeah, I'm incredibly honored. When we were uh, having the discussion about just being together, Peter J. brought up an amazing concept of what it's like to be an artist traveling together right? 
Mm-hmm. And, I, and we want to introduce the conversation of uh, what it means to be traveling on the same road. And Peter, would you like to maybe talk a little bit about some of that, that essence, like the history of our experiences mm-hmm. together and how you were introducing that in, in that discussion? Well, I'll give it a shot. You know what I mean? I'll make up half this stuff when we're talking live. But <laughs> I will say this. Today, I was just overwhelmed uh, by the desire to hear Donny Hathaway's rendition of uh, He Ain't Heavy, mm. He's My Brother, mm. especially this live version. Uh, so I played it today. Mm. And, you know, the the things, of course, that this uh, master singer could do is one thing, but the doorways that he opened up, and especially for me today, as my mother's 95th birthday, she would have been 95 if she had have, uh, stuck around with us. But as it relates to us, I mean, you know, of course, the world stage, what was it, 43, 44 Degnan was out. Yes. yes. <laughs> but that's where we all met. And um we have so much uh, uh, to, to say to people that they ever really wanted to know. But in a nutshell, you know, it's, it's incredible to think that when we first met back in the day, sort of as that road began, that we were, we were, we were in this little storefront. I call it the storefront with the halo. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I say we were Church. listening to each other without prejudice we were hearing each other. Uh, We were being moved, we were were being educated. I mean, frankly, who would have known we'd still be in conversation Mm -hmm. all these years later, Mm -hmm. which I think is a a message uh, that I like to certainly share, which is you don't know how long you've got on this sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And so you best do what Maurice White encouraged us back in in the 70s. If there ain't no beauty, Mm -hmm. you gotta make some beauty. Come on. Mm. For me, Mm. that has been, I mean, since my teens, that's been a guiding mantra. I don't get it right half the time, I'm sure. I'm sure there's some folks who have seen my ugly sides. Don't get me, you know, I ain't no knight in Mm. shining armor. But I have walked that road as as ethically as I've known how, even in disagreement, even in disappointment. Uh, And so, I mean, here we are, you know, uh, all, we've, we've known each other since the, the, the 90s and we've listened and we've grown and we've heard each other and we've made each other mm-hmm. better artists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, I feel like uh, a lot of times, you know, the word sacred is used a lot. Um, awesome. too. Uh, Everybody use awesome. Too. Yeah. But- <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, um, and I think that definitely I love I love I love the idea, Peter, of uh, having the world stage have a halo. Um, it certainly had an aura um, for sure. It certainly lives. I, I still believe that, I mean, even now the world stage is in a bigger space, a more comfortable space, you know, it's got, mm-hmm. it can accommodate more people more comfortably, especially in the summertime. <laughs> now it help us. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I really believe that it is, it really is our sacred space in so many ways. And um, Peter, I really like what you were talking about, about listening and uh, Shonda, I really like what you're talking about, about it making, I mean, Peter, Peter's voice more than anyone else's pushes me along to not be lazy in my writing. I mean, not to go for the okie doke, you know, <laughs> you know, and to um, challenge myself to take those risks. And by being a part of such a beautiful community, of such a sacred community, I know I'm going to, when I take those leaps, I know I'm going to be caught. Mm. And I may not, um, I mean, I'm always caught. So um, I really appreciate that. And I feel like in that space, I really, more than any other I've ever been in, I just feel like uh, People, whether they are us, our, our friends, our colleagues, people who have been our lovers, our loves, mm-hmm. our chil- people's children have grown up there. Um, mm-hmm. I just feel like we all really learned how to listen better. Mm-hmm. And it's my 
my um, it's my hope that in some way each of us, you know, and each of us are culture workers in our own way. Yes. I feel like everybody who walked through those doors, they were a healer, they were a musician, they were an educator, they were um, doing good work in the community. Um, so those satellites, those points of light all over the city and frankly, all over the world, um, I'm just, you know, honored to be a part of that, that holy chorus, really. Mm. I, I love that you that you you said the we become an army and I just remember mm. what Kamal Daoud always says Kamal Daoud is one of the co-founders of the World Stage in Lamert Park along with Billy Higgins mm -hmm. uh, Billy Higgins the most one of the most the most recorded jazz drummer in the world but Kamal Daoud would always say when he got up on the stage is that, that we are an army of healers yes and we have become it's almost as if they created that space for us to become that army of healers, but we also take it with us when we walk, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just like, just like church, you know, just like a sense of, I'm going to take this scripture, this mm -hmm. poem, those tears, uh, this mother with a baby, that young gangbanger who came in, the, whoever it is, and they have something of, of in, like import to say, yeah. and we take that with us. We take mm -hmm. it with us and it, it manifests in our writing and in our work as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm so grateful that the world stage uh, brought us to a different place as writers. But at the same time, we went on to found our own pieces. Like Peter, you did the poetry choir, which became mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an amazing um specifically for Los Angeles, but you know, there were more people in the audience from all over. But if you want to talk about the poetry choir, I, I, is, I miss it. I miss the poetry choir. <laughs> well, you know, it all was uh, an effort to stand the work up on its feet in a different way. I mean, actually, uh, Kamal gave me my first gig with musicians and it was a Trevor Ware, the great bass player. And Trevor and I, Kamal had something he had to cancel. So he said, Peter, go do this thing. Man, it was at the Dorothy Chandler. And the greatest advice I got from Trevor was, bro, don't worry about me. Just talk your poem. Just do your poem. He says, I can hear what key you're speaking in. Mm. So you just do your work. Don't worry about me. Wow. I, I got you. And as a result of that, uh, Every time we do an Inspiration House Poetry Choir, it's always with top shelf musicians, virtuoso musicians, so that when we show up with zero rehearsal, we simply start. And the next thing you know, these men and women start killing. Yes. And we start killing. Uh, and the whole vibration behind it, because I was at that time, I think just about doing the radio show at KPFK uh, mm. Inspiration House. Yeah. We called it Voice Music for a Whole Living. And the goal was simply to bring, uh, serve Pacifica's mission by bringing mm. a absolute vital range of yes. poets stylistically, uh, you know, orientations, you know, personal orientations, all the whole, yeah. the so-called race, all that stuff. And we was in there. And we start off with some Bobby Bird. And the next thing you know, folks are listening and grabbing poems and reading into those microphones. Yes. Uh, and when we got it right, it was transcendent. And we got it right a lot from 99 to 2004. Some people ain't even born. Wasn't even born when we was kicking that butt. Wow. You know. <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's important to let people know that this is, it is a road of... Um, yeah of service and also innovation yeah. and imagination. We're not just standing, I mean, nobody, y'all got, you guys, particularly you, well, I say Inyesha, because that's how I met you, Sharonda, but you know what I'm saying. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're a big time scholar. You've been at our major universities. And so you know that there's, that's a different way of presenting poetry very often. And it's, I'm not really mad at it. It's not an either or for me, yeah. but the thing we're doing tonight, the things that we, bring to the stage when we configure ourselves as sh poets standing shoulder to shoulder with musicians mm. listening to each other as in the Inspiration House Poetry Choir format, well, that is a magical way of spellcasting for me. And that's the way I look at 
all of this work where we're not tying ourselves to the page, though we respect it at all times. Yes, I think of it as a sense of how we get to educate our leaders Mm. too. Mm. You know, there's a sense uh, that, you know, poetry is the, the genre of emotion but poetry is also the genre of revolution. Mm. You know, mm. it's a Paul Revere was a poet. Mm-hmm. Wallace and Yenke was a poet. Mm. Nyerere in Tanzania was a poet. Mm. <laughs> and so there is a sense that the, the language that you write, uh, there's a, the, the euphemism, thoughts of things, right? Mm-hmm. So the, the language that you write, the stories that you tell yourself are the stories that you can envision and become. And so, and that goes back to the sense of healing. If you are someone who has had a life where you didn't get the things that you needed, but writing gives you back those things that you didn't get or writing gives someone else, you know, what they, what they didn't get. So I do think of language as giving a a, a bit of education to our, to our leaders, to healing, writing poems, um, giving me breath when I, when I felt like I was about to expire. (laughs) So, so yes, and I, I believe Cody, um, Cody wants to come on and say yeah. a few words. Got it. Yeah. I, yes, I loved hearing your mm. song, Shonda, your words, Peter, Imani, Shonda, I am so grateful that you joined Songs and Signs of Hope and Healing. I mean, mm. we're here, we're here to listen to you and I'm, I'm just want to thank you for that. Um, but I also have to do the the other stuff, which is That's like right. thank the, uh, the the sponsors and media partners who Produce, have come baby. on board and Produce. lent their support. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, I see um, I see people in the audience, uh, both here in Zoom and on YouTube. A lot of just really wonderful comments on what you've read so far. So um, yeah, it feels it feels good to be in this in this crew. Um, so for our sponsors and partners. I want to thank Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center for the additional support for this program, Mm -hmm. also to Poets and Writers. And um, for the entire series, we are grateful that Book Soup is making um, their services available. You can find Peter, Imani, and Shonda's books through Book Soup. Mm -hmm. You can also find them through bookshop.org if you're not local to LA or West Hollywood and um, a little further afield, you can do that via Book Soup or bookshop.org. And then finally, I'm just very grateful to the Los Angeles Review of Books, um, who's a media sponsor and uh, just a personal shout out to Janice Rochelle Littlejohn, who has been, you know, uh, my, my, um, a good voice in my ear and and constant encouragement for book, uh, for book swell Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, since it started. Um, So that's all I have to say because I want to save time for our um, writers, but I do want to introduce also Mike Che, who is the arts coordinator for the city of West Hollywood. Thank you to Mike for um, uh, making this possible. And we're also going to hear from a few officials from the city of West Hollywood um, who are going to join us and give us a couple remarks as soon as I can. get them on camera. And thank you to West Hollywood as well for bringing, sponsoring this, for allowing us to share our poems. Just want to thank you all. Looking forward to being in person at some point in West Hollywood. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you all. Thank you to all three of the readers tonight. Um, Special thank you to Cody, Cisco, and Bookswell for being the producers for WeHo Reads 2022. Um, As Cody mentioned, I'm the arts coordinator for the city of West Hollywood. And um, we are so happy to bring this to you. Um, There is a website called weho.org slash WeHo Reads. You'll see all the events there. You can, I highly suggest you check out the lineup. It's great. And then you can even RSVP so that you do not miss any of the great events happening. West Hollywood is really special because our city leadership um, truly believes in the power of the arts to inspire, to bring joy, to heal us. And so we have three of our council members, our elected officials here, who want to say a quick welcome to you all. Um, we've got our Honorable Mayor Lauren Meister, Mayor Pro Tem Sepi Shine, and Council Member John Erickson, who will all speak and, and welcome you. And so I'm so thrilled that they're joining us. 
Um, please, uh, Honorable Mayor Lauren Meister. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you, Cody, and our sponsors. Hello, everyone, I'm Mayor Lauren Meister. And on behalf of the entire city council, welcome to the city of West Hollywood's WeHo Reads, brought to you by our amazing arts division. I'm delighted to be here for the kickoff of the Road to Joy series. Uh, the city is incredibly lucky to attract these talented artists who are here to share their experiences and bring their stories to life. To Shonda, Peter, and fellow WeHo resident Imani, right. <laughs> I say thank you for taking us with you on this journey. Uh, to our viewers, I hope you enjoy the program. And now I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Mayor Pro Tempore Sepi Shah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, Mike and Chris as well. Uh, I am blown away and so inspired already. Thank you, Shonda, Peter, and Imani for sharing your incredible work and, this, and the discussion this evening. The theme for this evening is reflections on healing and hope, which we all desperately need as we have gone into now the third year of this pandemic. And as we continue to find ways to face, call out and dismantle systemic racism, your art is pivotal in the time we are in now. Thank you for sharing your joy, inspiration, healing and creativity, which helps all of our senses come alive again in West Hollywood. We are so, so grateful to you. Mm -hmm. And I wanna introduce my um, colleague council member, John Erickson next. I have, I was blown away to tears yeah. practically. I mean, in my car sitting on the side of the road because this is our life now where we're coming around and hearing your words, just removing. And I'm just so blessed to be in this space with all of you. And West Hollywood is such a special place because West Hollywood doesn't just invest in the arts. They're our primary focus when we look at how we uplift the arts. <sighs> and if there's anything that's gonna bring us through or continue to make sure we get through this pandemic together, it is the arts. And tonight's topic and conversation is just so poignant and beautiful. And go buy all of your books, every <laughs> single one of them. I'll say it, do it. I'm going to go to Book Soup again, and they're going to say you're buying more books. And I say yes, but that's why we support our local businesses and our local yeah. bookstores, but our local artists and our West Hollywood artists here and, and outside in Los Angeles. But I just want to say thank you for bringing so much joy to the world. Thank you for holding this space for tonight's topic. And thank you for just being the souls in this universe that will help us always come together when forces try to push us apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, Seppi, and John for sharing the support. It's really great to hear. Uh, we're going to transition now into, into some more readings. We're going to hear from Imani first. Uh, Imani, I want to read your bio for everyone so they know how awesome you are. <laughs> And then, sure. and then you'll, you'll, you'll run with it. Uh, Imani Tolliver is an award-winning poet, artist, educator, and author of Runaway, a memoir in verse. She is a graduate of Howard University where she received the John J. Wright Literary Award, served as poet laureate for the Watts Towers Art Center, and was awarded literary fellowships from the Cave Canem Foundation, the Lannan Foundation, and George Washington University. Imani received a Certificate of Congressional Recognition by the U.S. House of Representatives and a Certificate of Recognition by the City of Los Angeles for her work in support of the literary arts in Southern California. You can find her at imanitolliver.com. All right, thank you, Cody. Uh, Donna Summer. Thank God it's Friday, was at the top of the LP stack. My best friend and I read the liner notes and studied the illustrations. Between the folds of this cardboard angel, a double record set, promising a disco salvation, polyester wrapped dresses, glitter, and long, dark, curly locks. 
magenta on lips and cheeks. Gold, gold, gold. She was provocative, sensual, suggestive, and I understood it even then. Disco wasn't the truth exactly, but it was the projection of the dream that everyone was worthy of desire. Her songs were tempera polaroids, spinning jewel tone mid-calf skirts and capizio leotards, lithe and charming men co-authoring the illusion. It was 1979, Osco's disco was on La Cienega. <laughs> but at school, pop-locking brown boys with soft afros beneath Applejack caps cut break beats from side to side with their thumbs. Their hips turn styling single patients. Hip hop was on the horizon. I would have listened to Donna always and wouldn't have stopped. But at 12, I ran away from home, very nearly into the arms of street commerce. Bad Girls was always on the radio. They bought me white jeans, tight, and cut my straightened hair into a small afro, played Donna Summer songs, and encouraged me to sing along. Sexy. I started to feel sexy, desirable, not like a dirty heap of flesh to poke, not something that shameful things happen to. I was changing the story. I could be powerful, I thought. I could decide who touched me. Money had nothing to do with it. Choice was the currency. So were the new clothes. So were the chips and candy, as much as I wanted from the liquor store across the street. I wouldn't have survived it. I know that now. So many manipulations, so many people touching me, wanting something. What was it that drew them to me? I used to think that I was a dirty key to a dirty lock that lived in men. It wasn't Donna Summer's fault that her songs were on the radio. It wasn't her fault that predators used her music to convince me could a runaway make in 1979. Between getting beaten or heavy hands late at night, my father making sure my mother was asleep, braiding forever the pure sexuality that was my birthright. With him, it's the snare that I unhitch every time I touch. In those days, in the movies, disco was white, but in real life, it wasn't. It looked like Donna Summer, Sienna, bronze, fuchsia and cobalt blue. I mean, that's the way it was, the way it really was. I strained to see the colors through those hard, hard days. 40 years later, on the radio came on in the car and I wept as I sang, allowing myself again, finally remembering my innocent connection to her music, remembering how excited my best friend and I were when we faced each other, smiling widely, our mouths filled with baby teeth as we sang her songs, the LP spinning between us. Beautiful. Thank you. Put light there, keep the tonic pure. My body belongs to me again. I severed the agreement. I emerge bones strong and limber, so limber. I see myself now in the clean reflection, smell of seawater, and wildflowers, my locks a dark, dark brown, my hands and feet capable and wide. I am new, beautiful, 
essential. In the morning, see everything shine. Uh, this is a shout out to my wife, Beth. You found me. I was shutting myself away. Worn from my wounds, I made the deliberate decision to close the door to my desire. I had books, music, my work, crushes and activism. What use is desire, I thought, when its cost is so high? Loneliness was the lover I knew. And even though her song always spoke of loss, of missed chances, the words I was not courageous enough to speak, to hear, her song was the tune I knew so familiar because it was what I curled up to, wept into and held onto while wishing on new moons. She was the company I kept I wrote poems to her and built an identity, a face, a name from ache to be loved, seen, held. I always wanted to share my life, my body. The gifts my hands can make are limitless, I know. But with who and how, how do I trust again? How do I share my sorrows without shame? And what about my open places, the doorways hidden in my smile, the, the silly serendipitous rendering of joy with who, how? I have never known anyone more complex, precise as the making of a flower, the soft machine translating light into life open, warming to the sun. Powerful as an ocean tumble, sensitive as the skin translucent of the newly born. I can see the parts of you, moving thought into motion and sustenance. Your door is always open for those you love, wide as suns. In my lifetime, when loving was at its best, lovers have unfolded community to me, have broadened my spiritual consciousness, but no one ever guided me home to my true self. This Christmas morning, I share the first with you. There are lights on the mantel, food warming in the kitchen, the music plays and the bed is soft. My gifts to you this year are humble. Warm pajamas, a game to play. This poem and myself too. But not only on the occasion of Christmas, because every day I say yes to our journey. Once I had a wish to be as tall as Sequoia, all sunlight and shelter. Today, I want to be as open as valleys, holding the free prance of deer, tonic of blossoms, hummingbirds, supping at their open mouths. I want to be the love made by all animals, free in my desire, prolific, and satiated, holding your hand in this place that lives in both of us, where we dance and laugh, our faces holding first light and home, finally home. Wow. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. My, uh, my last poem tonight is uh, an ode to the library. Nice. Talk about sacred space. 
seeking connection with this page, which is to say, my heart. Oh, the confessions I've shared and relied upon to love me up when the tears of years has weighed me down so. Here at the library, I remember my first apartment blocks away, driving a carnation pink scooter all the way to work, <laughs> taking Venice Boulevard, cutting north until I got to Wilshire, just shy, just shy of Vermont. This was the upscale stretch of downtown LA, home to the Brown Derby, I Magnins and Bullock's Wilshire where polite luncheons were served, models donning pencil skirts and well-constructed purses with frozen hair and frozen smiles ambled in front of young mothers and well-behaved daughters eating politely while dreaming a future in those clothes, an accessible couture, magnificently tailored and ladylike, appropriateness attainable for a price. Here though, at the library, I'm remembering Saturday afternoons, curling up with the dictionary and the complete plays of Shakespeare, memorizing Richard III's monologue in which he claimed the audible ugly, the unfinished form that was woefully him. And me, barely 21, would weep these words as if I wrote them. As I spoke the verses aloud, they shaped the otherness I felt, the misshapen experience I lived. As a tall, big bone girl, growing up in the shadows of Hollywood, poolside with the nearly rich, mm -hmm. adjacent to the Beverly Hills experience, I never wanted, not really, except the access to self-acceptance the entitled stalwart stride through mm. each open door open widely for me. I wish I had chosen library doors instead of an all night movie house in the deepest downtown LA. Wish I knew how to turn my imagination around to a story in the stacks, a safe place. Instead of spending my last few dollars on roller skate rentals by the beach, my path followed by someone meaning no good, the breaking that would unfold into poems and hard work saving, saving. As I sit in the Venice branch library, there is the soft clicking of low heels, the whispered slide of shelves being restocked. There is a woman nearby, a mother most likely, her eyes thumbing young adult fiction. There is a tattooed middle-aged surfer watching a film on a portable DVD player. Between periodicals and books in Spanish, an older man, all silver, considers the stacks. I am sitting in a sunny place where Light is reshaped by vertical blinds, the crowns of palm trees and pendant lanterns above me. Perhaps there isn't a resolution to this life, but I will continue to do what I do best, speak what I claim to know and hope to be remembered by a shore that has recorded every transition I've lived the shore of books, I mean to say, the place of the open story that finds me as I become again and blessedly again. Thank you. Jeez. <laughs> wow. The shore of books yes. and the place of the open story. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm still thinking back to um, uh, tall as sequoias and open as valley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Imani. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Giamani. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, I'm sorry, Peter, you, you have to follow that. <laughs> Just another wave, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all about Peter Harris, but you probably know about him already, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And then we're going to hear, we're going to hear from him. Uh, Peter J. Harris, 2018 Los Angeles Cola Fellow in Literary Arts, Fellow of the Los Angeles Institute for the Humanities at USC, is the author of Bless the Ashes, Poetry from Tia Chucha Press, winner of the 2015 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award, and uh, The Black Man of Happiness in Pursuit of My Unalienable Right, a book of personal essays, which was the winner of a 2015 American Book Award. And some good news coming up in 2022, Flower Song Press will publish Peter's uh, Peter's book. I believe it's sorry, Peter. Um, I'm looking at maybe like an it's published Safe song again. Arms. Safe Arms. Safe okay. Arms. Baroque song again. Uh, Flower Song Press. Safe Arms. Thank you. Okay. Twenty Love. Um, Spanish translation by Francisco Letelier and Beyond Baroque Books will publish Harris's Song Again as part of its Pacific Coast Poetry Series. Harris is the founding director of the Black Men of Happiness Project, a creative, intellectual, and artistic exploration of Black men and joy. Harris writes the blog Reeking Happiness, a joyful living journal at inspirationcrib.com, which I'll put in the chat for everyone. Thank you, Peter. You ready? Let's do it. <laughs> Giddy up, love. Show me power eyes inflamed with doubt can witness. Laid children, laid family, laid women, laid money, laid time at your altar. Stood for you. Stood up to you. Bleed into me with an R&B transfusion. Dress morning sky in crimson when I pray. Spread moss under my feet when I dance after sunset's call. Marry me, love. Be good for me. Laid mother at your altar. Laid father. Laid memory, faith, hope tortured myself in your name, expressed myself without gain. Help me find my rhythm beyond blues. Help me moan till I regain my sight. Lay my tears, lay my loss, lay my want at your altar. Lay my groan, lay my ache. Giddy up, love. Gallop out my nostrils pull up to my bumper, wink at me, size me up, teach me rhythm beyond blues, show me power, eyes, witness your fame, can not doubt. Two immense dragonflies, stop action, free flight, trajectories up top churning water, daring me to slay demons arrayed like assassins, steaming up my breath and doubting up my sleep, intoning me to face tribulations with flamboyance of a maestro conducting transcendent orchestra. Shum on love. Who needs silver bullets, pockmarking road signs to the end of the world? Put down your gun, pick up your baby, save this earth from the palms of your hands. Hey y'all, today is my mother's 95th birthday. She left us in 1984. I rarely do titles, but this is called Painting by Numbers, Hymn to the Mother, Charles Lloyd. Ballerinas in a pas de deux, pirouette on wall of our living room, 
graceful sentinels remind us of Ma's warning. Never slam front door of number 304, where she has labored to create and curate serenity for a family of five and a museum within our two bedroom apartment. Books multiplying to become an intimate Black History Month walkthrough. LPs hinting at my future's eclectic cultural rambles. Andre Watts at the Hollywood Bowl. John Denver, take me home, country roads. Rachmaninoff, I learn, is not a stew. Leontine Price stuns my ear into evolution. Was that Paul Robeson climbing Jacob's ladder? Mom's is subtle brush strokes multiplied miniature blue numbers into a haunting hole. Charles Lloyd's hymn to the mother, concentration in psalm, calling through calling, invoking her delicious reverence for life, illuminating her persistence, revealing hope she wore on oval face of an abandoned child, echoing her passions to live beyond prescriptions of childhood diseases, shape-shifting her contours beyond whims and codes on bureaucratic forms, shaping invisible numbers on white cardboard, praising her harvesting her with musical brushstrokes that shepherd my return to a modest two-bedroom crib across the Anacostia River. An official orphan bookmarks another random chapter in the sacred book for haunted lovers, transcribes lessons from a January mother with a summer name, an oracle named June, taken way, way, way too soon. No guitar, no gat, no lame, no lean, no entourage, no bodyguard. Just, just a manhood thrown on the wheel of passion, fired in the family kiln, glazed by neighborhood eloquence. Perennial rhythm, no guitar, no lame, steep ritual, no entourage, no lean, season after season, sensationally unsensational, impervious. No gat, no bodyguard, no amp, no shank, no mic, no hose, no spotlight, no soldiers, just manhood polished by call and response on the sidewalks of improvisation, marinated within the tradition of innuendo, praised by the unseen hand clap of time. Perennial rhythm, no amp, no mic, steep ritual, no spotlight, no hose, season after season, unsensationally sensational, impervious, no shank, no soldiers, stepping with history as my homeboy, no entertainment tonight. No rhyme for the money changer's delight. No act sewn with threads unraveled from my powerless life. Yes, to words washed in honor on their way out my mouth. Yes, to sweat sweet with the courage of standing through all my doubt. Yes, yes, to art steaming with the incense 
to purify the lives in everybody's house. I see you. I see you. I see you. I'm going to close with a couple of love and erotic joints because there ain't no road to joy without love and erotic. Erotics, erotica, whole living. Foreplay of doves, mad flash of feathers, shadow splashed volume, shakes branches of trees. Startled voyeur slumbers on a porch. Avian desire converges with his own perpetual state of arousal. Awakens fever wish for cooing whisper from a thicket of loving arms. Can you rise on top of me right where we are? Radiant invitation closes afternoon eyes detonates cool of a novice trying to recite timetables in the presence of God. Partners stare each other down. Each one teach one in alternating current of satisfaction. Double-jointed peacock strip naked, breathe in the language of anointed flutes, move their waists in worshipful calligraphy slow their mashup to thread angel wings into dream catchers, dilute whole cases of fruit loops to dye singed feathers and brighten the passage of time. Ooh, love and be so good, even disentangling to fall asleep, feel like ghosting, betrayal, abandonment. Splash my face into the healing conspiracy of your sex. I blow kisses and mumble wicked nonsense. Whimper escapes your center, soft as our shadows in amber nightlight, irresistible as your trembling body on tiptoes. Looking down on me, you already know I am a believer. When my enthusiasm fails, I surrender to the gift of your entangled hands, shamelessly guiding me with synchronized contortions and essential perfume. Safe in this instant of backlit sovereignty, adorned like intuition fulfilled, we are underneath words now. Hours from a certain sundown, straddling fault line of first touch in search of initiation beyond shallow breath and hip evaporating hip. Keep it manual, baby. Gentle backhand, hesitant brush, roiling slow as reggae in second sight of dreadlock stare. Do I believe in syncopating eyes? Could you be loved? Heels blazing small of my back. Tip of me delicately tuned against her vibrating shake array. Nothing could unbalance threaded beer and bow strings awaiting gentle swat on our taut extension. Love is no rumor here, kissing face to face. I am a militant falsetto, disciplined as Shirley Horn, stir in drops of milk, sweeten shuddering hips. One lush breath warps time. We are transparent muslin, our lullaby skin as woven air, she, my Mardi Gras, everyday festival. When she take off her mask, her loving is the cool day gras. Giddy up, love. Giddy up, love. 
ये रही आपका यस पीछा यस 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 Cody, can I just go and you read my bio after? <laughs> Absolutely, I can put let's, a link in there so people can click here, through sister. and read you know it. How we let's, do it. Let's mm-hmm. poetry. Let's poetry choir it. Let's do it. in the room from my cousins Bruce and Cliff. Clifford Henry Stafford was the first to leave Kalamazoo's country backwoods roads, taking the black Indian dream dust our grandfather kept in the cool shaft of his double barrel shotgun above his bed. Cliff, the eldest son of the eldest aunt in the family, loved to cook had a wide, tender, girly smile, that good Indian hair, could do the bump, the rock, and love to play with the girls. Mm. When Cliff landed in Hollywood, his springy afro stood 10 feet high, lofty enough to brush the tops of Santa Monica palm trees and for God to say, man, you gotta pat that down. (laughs) He was my mama said, a good baby. When he showed up as an extra on Good Times, donning a tie-dyed t-shirt with a 70s psychedelic spiral circle, his baby doll smile, his full wolf lake water eyes, our dust fell from his sleeves when he slapped JJ5. His talk Coffee hues radiated from the screen when he smiled that Stafford smile. And back home, we all crowded around the TV and slapped each other five and said, ooh, that's Cliff. Look at my nephew, ain't he handsome, Aunt Irma said. Think he a big, bad Hollywood actor now, my eldest brother Lorne scoffed with pride. That's my baby, Aunt Mildred crowed. Ain't you late, Cliff? My mama said to the TV. Ain't you late? Cliff was the first one in our family to openly love a man. The first one to love a man who said after he'd been in Hollywood only seven years, well, I got AIDS and now you got it too. Cliff, tall and skinny as Madawan autumn corn stalks, was always sweet to me. Sweet like old people with soft hands and clear eyes like Grandma Manuel. Sweet like honey and lemonade, sweet as sweet does. He never leered like other cousins or uncles who pretended to hug, but felt the girl up in all the wrong places that nothing but water should touch. He cliff, he looked at me as if he saw something special in my eyes, something real swimming there like he recognized my dreams popping out of my scraggly plaits because he had them too. When I was 18, I moved to Los Angeles and within weeks I called. I said, Cliff, where you at cousin? When can I see you? Staticky background traffic laced his words, Sunset Boulevard and Gower Grit. Cliff, Cough slightly, don't know, baby girl. I'm working so much, you know, acting and stuff, but I'll let you know. 
Weeks passed, months. Los Angeles whirled like a carousel in front of my country backwoods, eyes fractured silver stars in a black water sky, celebrities, Chinese man theater, an ocean so blue it switchbladed your eyes open like a wound. Cliff had already seen it all when he was younger. There were rumors that a grandfather, not ours, turned Cliff gay. But we never talked about that back then. Cliff was a cousin. Gay wasn't a cousin. Cliff was a son and a nephew. Gay wasn't a son or a nephew. We didn't understand. The second time Cliff called me, his breathing was hard and raspy. He hat coughed his way <coughs> through a sentence and abruptly hung up. And Mama called me a week later from the hospital bed. Cliff smiled that Stafford smile. Eyes sad and sorry for dying on me, his little cousin, for not taking me to Magic Mountain. Mm -hmm. He pressed his hand into mine, hungry for warmth, to taste or feel something again, but his muscles leaked from his body. He was as translucent as a god, picked so clean I could almost see this bone soup of a man slipping from the sterile white sheets. And I wished I wasn't the one who had to tell people back home what had happened. The story of how a black Indian boy dies alone in his body in a too loud family in a cold hospital room across the country, dreamless, dust, Liz, the youngest daughter of his favorite aunt, looking on. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I write about heritage and family, and I'll read the first part of my book, Black Indian, and then I'm going to move to, to another piece of it. Wait. To tell you any of these stories, I have to tell you the first, the very first. Somewhere in Matawan, Michigan, there is an infant buried on top of a 13-year-old girl's grave. The infant, stillborn, was given a name anyway, but the wind buried the syllables under its cool tongue. The child sutured eyes and never kissed lips greeted that 1950s winter sky, the color of hair on wings when her father, my grandfather, opened another hole in the mute earth and laid his second unforgiving child's body to rest in her sister's slender waiting arms. Finally, someone to hold, Frida shifted and yawned into the earth. Together there, my two aunts, the virgin and the infant keep each other safe. They shared the secrets of each other's bones and there were lots of secrets. Maybe I am the unborn child. Perhaps she returned in me to tell our story from my woman child's hands, Velma Jean's daughter's hands, fourth girl child's hands. Since we are after all the baby girls and at once the sixth seed, we prefer the dent of rain in the earth to the din of voices, the fists, the liquor laugh screams at family gatherings. Equally, we cherish our silence. And if I am her, what did I see hovering over the farm before that last mound of dirt covered me? What would I say first? Maybe something about the Potawatomi, the Odawa, the Ojibwe building wigwams on riverbanks before French trappers, missionaries, and settlers came. Maybe I'd say something about mama's sweet cornbread and daddy's cold beer, the five little burnished Matawan fairies, mulatto skin, Pocahontas eyes. I would take you to the field, to Wolf Lake, to the bait house, push you in a tire swing, lace to the top 
branch of the weeping willow in the front yard push you until you were dizzy. And then I would say it, what I don't know, I can't tell. So that's the first chapter of my memoir, Who's Afraid of, uh, 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 my memoir, Black Indian. And I am going to read um, something towards the end that I rarely read. And when I get to this place, um, when I get to this place, you will realize why I rarely read this, this piece. Um, and I wanna, <clears throat> of course, it's always dedicated to my sister Rochelle, but I also wanna dedicate this to Regina King. <clears throat> um, it could have been anyone's son, that circle of men, boys with a gun, in that neighborhood, Jason, my nephew, where he wasn't supposed to be, on the couch of one of the boys who wasn't supposed to be there. He wasn't supposed to hang with them. It could have been anyone's son. Who were the others who survived? Who'd watched him put that gun to his mouth? Who'd watched him smile and pull the trigger? Where did the gun come from? Where did they get that gun? Which one of them held the cold metal last and was grateful they'd given it away. Which one of them knew my nephew was about to swallow a bullet? This time, when I land at O'Hare Airport and then drive to Kalamazoo, I'm not looking for understanding, reconciliation, or love like I did at my aunt's funeral. How can Jason do this to my sister, I fumed. But when I walked into my mother's house, my resolution to be angry at everyone dissolved. Hey Shonda, my mother greets me hitching up her pants. She is angry. She isn't playing cards. She doesn't hug me. Her eyes are rock hard, red, but dry like a bull's. I remember the girl from her pictures, the innocence, with that big, serious adult face and the charming smile. Before me now stands a mother who will not hug me for fear that I'll make her cry. She will not cry because if she does, the whole family will cry. And the entire day, the light, the earth will break and it will all cry. No one ever sees the willows weeping. As if we'd rehearsed this, mama points me towards the guest bedroom. I find my sister Rochelle there sitting on the edge of the bed, rocking herself a fistful of tissue mangled. I drop beside her and squeeze her until the tears flow like thick milk. One by one, like a tree tribe coming home for the harvest. My brothers and sisters arrive. They file in, all of us crowding around Rochelle, leaving her no space, touching her legs, arms folding around her like rose petals. And she is the pistol with pollen leaking from her pores, her hands limping with uncontrollable sap. We, the petals, hope to catch something to save her. I don't believe it. She muffles a sob in my shoulder, then turns to Lorne, the eldest, who flew in from Vegas. I don't believe it. Lorne holds her tight at intervals. She looks full from our love and attention puffed up, and then the memory of her son's death returns, and she is as hollow as a chicken bone, her marrow dry. I think, Lauren says, all y'all's fat ass is going to break mama's bed. Then mm -hmm. she going to beat y'all, not me. Mm -hmm. Self-consciously, we rumble, laughter low in our throats. He mm -hmm. breaks the ice. Lauren's presence, his stinging mirth, farmer brown, strong, pushes back the sorrow for a time so we can loosen up. Mm -hmm. It's good that he is here. Like peacock feathers, we spread out to give Rochelle room to breathe. We circle her 
coming in and out, studying the patterns, measuring our steps around each room in my mama's house. We walk, we step, we cry, we laugh, we wait. <sighs> so. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, mm. powerful, mm. so powerful. Oh, thank oh. you. And um, th- do I have time for one more, one short one, Cody? Yeah, we'll, and we'll move into Q&A right after. Okay. So uh, this poem is published in the anthology uh, that I edited, Voices from the Mert Park, which is one of the first books that captures the poets of the Mert Park, the World Stage, Fifth Street Dicks, mm-hmm. Lucy Florence Coffee House, any place that was holding spoken word and poetry. Um, I tried to capture as many voices as I could. And this poem, Fumble, is what I feel about writing and life and writing and love and writing. Fumble. And you ask yourself, what are you doing here again? And you turn away from the prayer stone with two spiders spinning whispers on your shoulders, crossing each supple breast down to shoulder navel, creasing dank vestiges of pubic hair, and you walk to the edge of the sea with memories as gangly and graceful as a child's first step, clinging to your Spanish moss skin like yester thoughts do. And you know memory is a thing done under the blanket, deeper than whale songs, forging bones out of sound, song, coral and silt, two cysts wrestling with thunderbolts, trying to escape silver sheets, turning bliss into Jones, love into a nickel bag, high your language into willows that feed you. And you wonder which rock will fit all those words you spewed about commitment and marriage Wished you could have them back, (laughs) swallow them whole, salt and all, when that lover or that friend or that one rained on your chrysanthemum as you took notes and wrote poems. And your nine-year-old princess peeks in the candlelit room, cuts the golden haze and asks, Mama, read it to me. Mm. And you wonder, which story to unlace for her shiny new dress gaze, what to pour into those guileless palms, lines, still kitten whisker thin, never having known the spider and sea and rock people and language, vaying for your attention while you write that last note that only a mermaid, only the oracles can hear. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Shonda. <sighs> thank uh, you, everyone. Um, one of our uh, audience members says, Shonda, thank you for gently laying out the marrow of family. Mm-hmm. Um, this has been so powerful and beautiful and and we do have a little bit of time for questions uh so if you're in the zoom you can put them into the q a if you're on youtube you can just put them in the comments and i'll relay them i you know i think a lot about the relationship of writing and healing and all of you write and and produce work that delves into your personal history and to your um you know soul i'd love to hear kind of does it does it help you to get it on the page does it transform the experience or how does that how does that work for each of you well uh, for me um it's an absolute healing practice i mean um my first journals uh were given to me by my mother when i was uh i mean a little girl really and i think for me I, I start off with whatever the issue is, whatever the concern is, um, sort of moving around my, my, my thoughts. And then 
Um, so the process of definitely um, getting those stories out of me, getting those concerns or getting the sorrow out on a piece of paper is one journey. And then when I share it with other people, especially in front of an audience, that's another journey because then I have witness, right? And then uh, in the best of worlds, not only do I have witness, but I have reflection. So if people say, oh yes, you, you know, I've experienced that too, then there's another healing that happens. And then of course, you know, when we publish our work and we hear from people, um, it's just uh, that definitely it's, 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 it's full circle and it lives on. And as the years go by, I find that the poems, um, even though they may be the same words in the same order, um, as I get older and as I look back at the healing that I've, that I've been doing about what I was writing about, um, something new happens again. And then I kind of learn from myself again. Um, so definitely, it definitely is a healing practice, just writing the words down for sure, Cody. John? I think Imani said it so beautifully in mm. terms of that reflection and the reverberation of healing, just first getting it out for yourself. Um, for me, I don't always start with the issues per se. I just start with a feeling or an intuition of a, um, this needs to be said or, you know, and then it becomes the thing of a, um, if you, if you want as Octavia Butler if you, or Toni Morrison, if there is something that you want to read and it's not there, write it. Mm. If you, you have to produce that for yourself. And so, and then I go, okay, how do I say this? How do I write a poem about my, my cousin who was one of the, the victims of patient, uh, I forget what he was called. Um, the, there was a man who was going and giving uh, mm. people AIDS in, in um, yeah. Hollywood. Patient zero. I Patient think. zero, yes. And my cousin was among those, those oh. people. And uh, so how do I write this? You know, how do I tell that story? And, and, and it was ex exactly how, how, I, how I wrote that. And then the same for the memoir. You know, how do I tell a story about a family who on paper, we are listed as African-American or at that time, Negro but the oral history is we are also American Indian and you've got some white in you. And so I'm like, who, who this needs to be said, who can tell mm. the story? And, and then it was, well, you have to tell that story. If it's mm. not there, if it's not on a bookshelf, you have to tell that story. It's the writer's calling, the vocation, the responsibility, the, um, the, the right to speak, right? Mm -hmm. Permission to speak speak you give yourself permission to do that so but I think what Imani said was incredibly beautiful yeah, yeah I do yes yes and I also add that um this is work as well this is not just confession this is not just mm -hmm. you know anything that comes out stays on the page and I think it's critical to share uh, certainly with the folks who are here with us that everything that, uh, just speaking for myself now, I mean, th there is no uh, voice from God here. This is really, really crafted mm -hmm. concentration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk about shout outs. I mean, I'd I like to thank, well, first y'all two, because we, we used to sit in the stage 8.30, what, what was it, 7.30 to 8.30. In fact, if a poem was really bad, we'd say 7.30, bro. <laughs> come on in <laughs> i mean so we we try to you know honor that legacy i mean but in la there's so many marvelous um writers so many marvelous editors uh, you know my friend cecilia wallach uh just a marvelous poet in her own right uh but i've just recently worked with her on on editing a uh, song again and the exchange, as she called it, was was like alchemy because mm. we both cared about the storytelling and all of that. Mm. But, she, but she never let me slide. She said, bro, you know, you could read these poems and kill them, but you might want to circle X, Y and Z here because it's kind of weak, you know, between me mm. and you. Because, you know, when you said so, like when you said, bro, uh, 
Peter, you got to follow. I want to follow this kind of greatness. I want to ride the, you know, talk about a book swell. I want to be at the peak of that swell, bro. You know, so <laughs> yeah. if if I read in shoulder to shoulder uh, fashion, like with Shonda and, and Imani, we expect to turn each other out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we know the work that we've done, even though we haven't seen each other, we don't see each other every day or anything like that. We know that we're putting in the work. So yes, it is healing work, but it's actual artistic work as well. And I think it's really critical to say that so that we never get lazy because this road to healing is a full participation road. Mm. It's a full, because the road is not going to be straight. It's not going to be without its absolute, you know, disruptions. And so you really better be ready. And you do that by study, by holding hands, as Imani likes to say, you, how you going, how you going to hold hands with a fist? What's that line, Seth? You know, How are you going to hold hands with anyone with your fists all balled up? All like balled that? up like that. You know what I mean? So this is about healing, hard-earned healing. Yeah. Well-earned healing. This ain't no yeah. namaste whisper in a library voice around a <laughs> yoga salon. All oh, that's no problem. Mm. I know you got to work and sweat in a yoga class, but I ain't got to never say namaste. And I can always sound like I'm from Southeast D.C. Yes. And I will show you that round the way genius is a real yes. deal. Yes, it is. Right. Right. I love that. And I love how you always say my name with that East Coast swing. <laughs> Sean. <laughs> the, like shoddy. <laughs> Throw them extra R's. Yeah. Is there an aura? Is there an aura? <laughs> I love it. Like he's chewing it. Like it's good. There's a question in the chat. Uh, Joshua was asking us, what's our writing practice? And do you sit down daily at a, a specific time in a specific place? And I do want to answer that because I at the beginning of the, actually at the end of last year, I developed a schedule of nine to 11 daily, um, mm-hmm. unless I'm teaching. So to, now I'm back Tuesday, Thursday teaching but I have so many writing projects that I, I literally had to go back to old school. I couldn't mm. let inspiration be my, my like, I'm inspired to write, sit down and write. Mm. I was like, nope, Octavia mm. Butler, this mm-hmm, mm-hmm. nine to 11, uh, get out the poems that I have to write for the COLA grant that I received mm. <laughs> from the city of LA. Um, so I'm working on a collection of poem, poems about the founders of Los Angeles and the indigenous, the indigenous people who oh, came wow. before the founders. Um, so I'm like, write those poems, finish the Nina Simone book, edit the, you know, edit that book, work on your, the, the manuscript for Black Indian. I had to set a nine to 11 schedule Saturday and Sunday as well. And if I'm push it back because I'm working out, quote unquote, <laughs> I actually do work out. But if it's like 930, then I'm like, okay, 930 to 1130. I've got to mm. keep that schedule. It's my commitment to finish these projects. So I don't know um, how, how other people, um, what your practice is for writing. Miss you too, V. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why I say it's work. You know, the first person who used to talk to me about that kind of schedule was Mike Datcher. Mm. He used to say, I get up at 4 a.m., man, I'm ready, I'm rolling. You know, mm-hmm. take a walk, play the drums or whatever. But he's the first person because I didn't, I don't write like that. I don't mm-hmm. have a set schedule. Uh, you know, I had kids real early and I had straight jobs. So I was like, yeah, I write when I can write. Um, I, you know, as I moved into <clears throat> the season of life, when I'm not having to dash off at somebody else's beck and call, I certainly know how to be on a day. I went to Howard University School of Communication. Hey, come on now. So I know <laughs> deadlines. I know and revere deadlines. And so I either meet them or beat them. You know what I mean? Uh, that's how I was trained literally mm-hmm. as a, as a scholarly dude. I certainly am no scholar, but, but no, I, I think for the questioner, t- take the work as seriously as you take yourself, you know, uh, and, and never, never fall in love with your work. Always be open to making it better yeah. either by, you know, 
apprenticing to someone or to uh, or otherwise do your homework you should be reading way more than you're writing um mm -hmm. and you should be throwing away i think charles johnson says he throws away 30 pages to one that kind of stuff so it's really serious to share in the spirit of this theme at least for me um you, this ain't no you know he, healing and, and 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 service this ain't no joke mm -hmm. this is no no play thing you know, people are dying, you know what I mean? Uh, not just in this. I mean, I, I certainly, you know, that story you tell about your cousin. I mean, you know, I, I was in my 20s in the 80s. You know, I was in San Francisco reading about the first, you know, patients uh, with AIDS, et cetera. And although I'm a straight dude, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in this thing to be whole and ethical and, and about, you know, the collaboration that it needs including brothers and sisters and act up saying no man don't don't kill us right. let's 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 allocate our money uh for our health yeah. you know what i mean you can you can you can you can all of a sudden write a check to send some some bazookas to afghanistan but you can't write a check to make sure everybody got health care come on don't, don't right. Uh, right on so yeah that's my writing practice reading thinking serving mm -hmm. being a citizen yeah. of of profound commitment to big ideas yeah. uh and 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 i want to be on the winning team mm -hmm. i want us all to be safe right. that's my writing practice whoever asked that question and it's working too i think peter one of your most profound lines for me is put down your gun pick up your baby mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Put, put down wow. your gun, pick up your baby. And that's just the simplest, the simplest way of saying, do that work, do that work. So beautiful. Well, I'm glad that you're both saying that too, that, you know, a lot of times I, I just think about Alice Walker's essay, um, oppressed hair puts a ceiling on the brain. <laughs> and she's talking about, uh, She's talking about how, like, when we think about the word healing, mm. that um, it sounds like something that should be easy, should be comfortable, you know. But in fact, healing, like writing and like crafting our work is a very kinetic process. It's a physical mm. process. Mm. And she talks about a seed, imagining a seed in the soil pushing through itself you know we've mm. seen those um those videos where they show what a seed goes through as it grows yeah. through itself shedding itself and then shedding man, itself oh, again and then pushing through the soil toward the sun and she talks about how that experience has got to be definitely uncomfortable yeah. and um Come on. that's that's you know i love the name of this series Cody, I love it. Yes. And, and I, and I just want to honor the yes. work it takes to stay present mm -hmm. during this time, mm -hmm. the work it takes to be vigilant uh, in, in our own safety, mm -hmm. um, right. the work it takes to be healthy and keep our chins up. And in the words of earth, wind and fire, That's right. <laughs> keep our heads to the yeah. sky. Yes. So, <laughs> it's not easy. And mm -hmm. I just want to honor that too. And yes. I agree with all the writing processes. Mm -hmm. I, I fall within the spectrum of both of my colleagues here, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, it's not easy. It's not yeah. easy keeping your chin up, but that's what we must do. I think it's going to be, easier for everyone who was able to tune in now and on the replay hearing your words i think is helping them to keep their mm. eyes to the sky yeah so thank you yeah Shonda. what a great lineup you have coming up too bro this is I, a marvelous series man i am so excited about it I, and you guys kicked us off in like the best possible way um i guess i should share the info about what's coming next uh which is our own Los Angeles yeah. Poet come on, Laureate, come on, man, and y'all, nice. <laughs> Miss Lynn Thompson, <laughs> and yes, yes, um, yes. Natalie, Natalie J. Graham. Graham is the Poet Laureate down in Orange County or something. Exactly, that's right, that's right. And, and Lester Graves Lennon yes. and Kamari Carter Hawkins. So really? I I can't and wait. Ways. I mean, it's going to come very wait. soon. Wow, I love it. I, Shonda, Peter, Imani, thank you so much to oh, everyone Cody, who is in the you. audience. Thank you. Oh, thank you, honor. Cody. And this is just the first step. We are we are here. Uh, our voices will be heard and yes. we'll be around throughout 2022. 
also to hear from a lot of um, other poets and to continue the conversation among us. And uh, the thing that I look forward to, maybe it's 2023, who knows, at some point, we're all going to be together again. Face to face. Face to face. Mm -hmm. Arm to arm. Yes, yes, yes. Poem to poem. A lot of food in the house. A lot of food in the building. A lot lot of food. food. All the food, all the music. Thank you, Yes, thank you. We ho. Absolutely, Mike. Thank you. How you do that? The mayor. (laughs) Come on, Peter. You can do this. I'm so against Uh, hearts. You know I do do hearts in my poem. I can't even do the heart. You can do it. It's not cliche if it's your hands. What? Okay. How about this? How about this? Oh, we'll give virtual hugs. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you to all our readers. You were all amazing. Fantastic. You You just kicked us off so well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Everyone have keep, a, a, yeah, keep okay. an eye out for my brother in West Hollywood, Michael Lagon, who's got this marvelous program, uh, okay. The History of Afro-Classical Composers. Mm, I'll sweet. be on the lookout. He's busting it. Sweet. Send me that I gotta info. give him love. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll spread it around. I will. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good night. Have a good week. Yeah, uh, thank you. Good Cole. luck with 2022. And mm-hmm. we'll be back. And and thanks again, Sean to Peter yeah. and Lonnie.